Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with legendary jazz saxophonist and flautist Kenny Garrett. We covered his latest 2021 CD, Sounds from the Ancestors, as he recalls the sounds of West African music and its role in jazz, gospel, Motown, hip-hop, and more. We cover quite a bit in a revealing talk, like his stellar career with stints around the likes of Miles Davis, Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, Donald Byrd, Freddie Hubbard, Woody Shaw, and the great Duke Ellington Orchestra. This Detroit native has had a solo career that's lasted three plus decades, and he is consistently seen as one of modern jazz's brightest and most influential living masters. He opens up quite a bit, and you should hear it. Enjoy. I love this new album, man. What a beautiful amalgamation of culture and histories and and just genres it's such a beautiful listen well thank you my first question to you is this you know we've gone through this very self-reflective time on planet earth we've all been kind of thrown into the same boat with COVID-19 lots of self-revelatory things going on how did this time influence this project well actually this time did influence the project this project was recorded November December of 2019 so the concept was already in motion before the pandemic really hit. Mm-hmm. So I guess my follow-up to that is, now that you look back at that time prior to all of this, how does this feel? Does this kind of put it more into focus for you? It put it in focus. I, I, I kind of feel that there were a lot of lessons that we needed to get. You know, that whole year just sitting, it was definitely reflective. And, you know, I could start thinking about what the things, you know, you can be a better person. You know, you can do things differently. You know, I think it, it was a lot of lessons that we had to learn. And I'm, th- I'm thankful, you know, for the, for, for the lessons and the, and the blessings. You know, uh, you know, it was a great opportunity. You know, my grandkids were here, grandson, granddaughter. You know, my daughter's here. So I think it was really good for me. And, of course, I had to stop it. I wasn't traveling. I've been traveling since I was 17, 8 years, 18 years old. So it was a, a good period for me just to kind of stop and rethink, you know, about life and, you know, try to hopefully, you know, I can come out a better person, you know, because it's a year of reflections. It wasn't just me by myself. It was a whole world. So I think to me it was, it was, it was a bigger picture than this, you know, about, you know, you know, uh, being the, you know, the Chinese or the Japanese or the Europeans. It was a whole world. And I thought that it was a whole bunch of lessons we were supposed to learn. And I hope, you know, that we come out, you know, with it being better. I, you know, sometimes that doesn't happen because if you look at all the adversity we've had, a lot of times we're there for that moment and then we go back to being who we are. And I think that's the hard one because, you know, that's kind of who you are. But I, I'm hoping for myself that, you know, I'll be able to make some changes, you know, with how I react to things and, you know, when I think about life and what's important, those kind of things, you know. You know, as a very wise artist and musician that has decades of experience with a multitude of musicians, many albums, many miles across, how important is it us for us to get back to our ancestors, as this album says, the sounds from the ancestors. Is it important as an artist, no matter where you're at in your career, to hearken back to the beginning, to the, to the alpha of who we are, to understand where we're going still? Well, it's always, get, it's always uh, and you're going to get there uh, somehow anyway. I think, you know, I always look at it that we have lessons we have to get. And we also have chapters in the book that we have to close. And sometimes you can't move to that next chapter until you close a chapter before that. If you're in chapter one or chapter four, you got to close that chapter. And I think, you know, even when we, if we're not looking to get there, it stops you and it shows you that, well, you know, you have to deal with this. You have to deal with it at some point. It comes back. I mean, even like, you know, the journey of going back to the beginning of, you know, a musical career or any career, you reflect because there are things that you, you know, you understand. You know, it's a different time. There's something that you understand that you didn't understand before. And it puts you in that place where you need to be. So that's why I say you can't really close the chapter. You have to close the chapter before you can move on. And you know, it just stay you just stay in that you know in that kind of spiral until you can figure those things out. So you specifically picked the sounds of, of West African music. Why was that? Why was it this sound that you were going for that turned into this album? Well, it was from the experiences that I was receiving. I mean, I've been playing with Chucho Valdez for the last five years. You know, on and off. You know, it's interesting. The first time I met uh, the percussionist, Dresser Deruti, when I heard him playing, and he was doing a Yoruban chant, I was like, what is that? What is he saying? What's going on? Well, that was about five years ago. I mean, 
And I was trying to figure out, but no one, I didn't speak Spanish, so I couldn't really go to the guy. I said, well, what is that? What's going on? But that music, uh, I was searching for that. I didn't know what that music was. And as I kind of kept playing with Chucho, I realized, matter of fact, I was introduced to that music before through Dabi Sanchez. Uh, he gave me some, some traditional music, Puerto Rican music. He had given it to me years before. And I had heard that sound, but I didn't really recognize it because no one was sitting with me hand feeding. I was just listening, taking it in. And I said, well, this sounds here. But once I got there, I started saying, well, this is what I've been looking for. And I wanted to absorb it. So that's why I went back to, you know, to, to Western Africa because basically that's where it was coming from. That sound was coming from there. So they took me there. And then when I would play, they heard some of my playing that was complimenting what they were doing, and they were looking for me. So I'm looking for them, and they're looking for me. And, and the same thing with uh, Pavito Martinez. I met him years early, and he was sitting down. I don't remember that because I wasn't in that space at the time. But eventually we hooked up, and that's what I had been searching for. Like I said, sometimes you're on a journey trying to find something, and that was the music that I was hearing. So, wow, this, that is okay. You know, so sometimes we don't. We don't know what it's called until we get in an environment. It is sometimes there's culture differences, there's language barriers that are causing you not to understand it as quickly as you possibly, you know, could, could you know grasp it. So I mean, it's taken me five years, and I've been trying to you know do some music with Chucho, and in turn I end up creating the music that I was hearing from that. And you know, I think a lot of times the music that I'm recording is just an, you know part of my experience that I'm trying to share you know with the world. You know, with each successive album, you emerge stronger, you evolve, you, you come up with a brand new artistic artifact for the world that, that embraces it. But also coming out of COVID, how do you see yourself emerging stronger? What did you learn about yourself over this time of quarantine that maybe you didn't realize because life was moving so fast or you didn't have that calm or that peace that, that you, you know, you probably, you know, recognized in a different way during this time? I recognize more of the things were important for us as people. You know, you know, it's a cliche, you know, the family. But you start to recognize because we can't, we're moving so fast. But that's the nature of the game. But I think now a lot of people are going to come out and they're going to choose different things. I mean, what they were doing before, maybe they won't be in the big city. Maybe they'll go to a smaller city. You know, maybe they'll do something else because if you realize that it's not what you thought it was. We were just in this, uh, on the, uh, on the treadmill. And, you know, this treadmill was moving, and we didn't get a chance to see. But once we all stopped, I mean, all the energy calmed down. Everybody was in the same place. I think, you know, that's what allowed us to really to see, what, you know, what we need to learn or the lessons we need to get. But for me, I just kind of felt that it was mainly about, you know, the family slowing down. It's like, well, you don't have to do all of that. You can just you can do half of that. You don't need to do all that. You can do this. That's not that important. You know, you prioritize and what's important now opposed to before you were just, you know, you're just on, the, on, the, on that treadmill of life, just trying to move and move and move, you know, trying to get ahead, ahead, ahead. So after a while, you start to realize, well, it's a little different. You know, throughout a, a musician's life, you gain all of this wisdom from the elders and legends you've been around. And you've been around magnificent ones like Art Blakey and Miles Davis. What did these musicians teach you that you in turn have taught younger musicians that you've been around, whether it's being about being a musician or about living through this very complicated existence we're all in. What did they give you? I think what, what Art Blakey and Miles gave me, two different takes on the same story. Uh, Art Blakey taught us about the music coming from the creator to the musician to the audience. Miles Davis didn't speak about it so much. He just showed you what it was. Art Blakey said what it was. Miles wanted you to find what it was. Uh, my first experience playing with Miles, uh, I remember he played a line. He played this the you know, musical line, and I played it back. He played it uh, something different. I played it back. He didn't tell me to do it, or he didn't tell me I, I shouldn't do it. I just did it. It seemed like it was natural. And at, you know, in retrospect, I started to learn that he was passing on this language. So I'm learning this language. That's the same thing I do with my band. I'm not really saying what it is so much. I'm passing this information on to the band where they would be prepared to carry it on. And I think that's the same thing with Blakey. I mean, a whole bunch of people came from our Blakey School of Music. We just, we all out, you know, trying to pass on his message. His message was basically, only thing that follows you to great is respect. He said, the quote he always used to say, well, I've never seen an armored car fall a hearse. Well, mm -hmm. that's true. He said, only thing that follows you to great is respect. So, uh, you know, all we're trying to do, all I'm trying to do really is just kind of create a, a better 
better place or some music for people to hear that maybe they'll be inspired by it, motivated by it. And in turn, when I'm not at that point where I hope I don't get there, but when I do get there, I want those same people to come back and say, okay, Kenny, come on, it's time to go. You know, that's how I kind of look at pass on the information. And then, you know, maybe I can't do it anymore. But even if I, at that point, somebody can say, well, come on, man, would you taught us? And let's go do this. You know, so that's how I look at it. You know, the, the younger musicians come in. You know, you share it with them. They take it on and pass it on. They come back and get you. It's okay. We need that person because we still need all these lessons. For example, when I did uh, my first uh, uh, introducing Kenny Garrett, I had Woody Shaw, one of the elders. Then I had Ron Carter and Elvin Jones on African Exchange Student. Then I had uh, Joe Henderson on Black Hope. I've always had the elders on my record to make sure that I was moving in the right direction. You know, the one thing about your career is that not only has it been longevity, which I don't know that, that, that people pay – enough credence to that, but you've also consistently had mass appeal. You've consistently evolved. What's been part, the ingredients or secrets to the success for you that you've always stayed relevant and timeless in all of your artistic pursuits? Well, you know, I, I, don't, take, I don't take music for granted. It's something that I love to do. And when I first started, you know, I think it was, I would do record every, every two years or something like that. Not that I planned it. I just think when the music is there, you present the music. And I think that's the only thing is that I, I'm always, you know, cognizant of what's going on, you know, with, with uh, you know, in, in the streets, as I call it. I might, my ear to the ground. I'm always aware of that because basically what it is is a continuation of something that's already been pushed, you know, put out there. So I'm always listening. I'm always checking out younger musicians, going back and checking out the old records. You know, um, you know during the pandemic, I was checking out uh, – you know, Sidney Bechet and, uh, you know, Louis Armstrong. And then also classical clarinet music. I'm just checking out everything, just things that you might have missed and you just get a chance to, you know, to reflect on it. But after a while, you start seeing as a whole, I mean, this is, you know, just things, you know, you have to work on your weaknesses. And then you come, you know, come to that point. But as far as just the, you know, the, you know, staying present, I just, I mean, I listen to every day. I mean, I'm listening to Nas's new CD now. I'm, I'm listening to every day, just trying to figure out what they're hearing, what's going on, what's different. Because that's who I was when I was younger. I was just listening to music. So I don't stop that because I'm established. You know, I've been around for 30 years. I'm still listening, trying to figure out what's going on. Oh, okay, that's interesting. I like that. Or oh, that's kind of reminiscent of that. There, I'll give you a story, and I, and I move on. There's a story. Uh, there's a great drummer, Chris Dave. He played with me. And uh, I remember I was, uh, guys were saying, okay, I said, okay, that's fine. So I, I was listening to some rock. And I let the guy, the, another drummer, hear that. He said, that sounds like Chris Dave. I said, yes, yeah, way before Chris Dave. So the concept was there, and he probably didn't hear that, but we still got to the same. He got to that point of someone else who was thinking a certain way. And that's how I kind of look at music. Like sometimes a younger guy will come up with something that was already there, and he'll say, oh, okay, this is new, but not necessarily so. But it works because then they, go, they feed from that and go, to, you know, go someplace else and try to create something that would you know, be presented as being something new. So speaking of that magic of youth, if you have a dream tonight and you run into your younger self, like around the time that you were starting to become a professional, and you could give yourself one piece of advice based on what you've learned throughout all these years. And this isn't a regret, regret question. This is speaking to the youth and saying, you know what, I've learned this, and I want to give this to you. If you could give your younger self one piece of advice, what would it be? Just keep doing what you're doing. I would, just, I would tell my younger self, keep doing what I'm doing. I mean, it's it's brought me to this point where I'm now. I couldn't, I wouldn't change anything. It's uh, I would just, you know, continue to do what I'm doing. Uh, yeah, it's that that question is it's a good question, but it can go a lot of different ways. But you want one answer, so it might be a little, <laughs> it might be a little, <laughs> a little difficult to come. Might be a little difficult to come on one line for it. But I understand what you're saying. I I think I would just, you know, if that's a hard one because I think in some ways I would probably tell myself. I'm trying to figure out what I would tell my younger self because the only thing that I would think is that when maybe it's not what you think it was going to be, maybe it's not what it's, it's cracked up to be. You know, sometimes we think some things are going to go this way and it doesn't go that way. And I'm not talking about just musically, just in life, it goes another way. So we don't really know everything. So I just tell myself, you know, you know, just stay open, stay open and uh, keep absorbing and take it in. I'll go with that one. <laughs> Amen. I like it, man. You know, during during this time of quarantine, too, I'm sure there was probably a lot of thoughts, reflective thoughts about, you know, your career and live music. 
Are there any magic moments that you had on stage that really kind of put a smile on your face during this time when you couldn't perform live? Basically, like I said, just being with the, the family has been great for me. You know, as far as like musical uh, situations, not really that happened after, you know, I, I played like uh, last week in Newport. That was special. I was in France. That was special. Because you realize, well, you don't take it for granted, but I never took it for granted. And so I, I want to do the same thing I've before, share music and uplift the people if I can. Beautiful. Every day you wake up, you get to be an artist. You get to craft beautiful audio pieces for the world to listen to. So my question is, what's the greatest thing about being a professional musician? Every day you wake up and you get to do that, what do you like the best about it? I like the freedom. I like the freedom. I like the freedom to, to do what it is I love to do. And to follow up with that, you mentioned Newport and other shows. You know, since everybody's been away from live music, and unfortunately we're entering new phases of this ambiguous uh, COVID threat, but there's been live shows, and there will continue to be live shows with safety measures. What do you hope we all realize about the power of live music when we do get back in earnest? And even in these these smaller shows or these, these uh, things that are starting to kind of pop up, what do you hope we get from this? Because we were away from it for so long. Well, I think what I, I realize is that we need each other in order for the world to, to move. So, you know, we can go out and play. Uh, the streaming hasn't been the, the best idea, but I think when the audience is there, it's another, it's another energy. And, you know, we're giving the, the audience energy, they give the energy back to us. So we need them and they need us. You know, and I think without, without music, this, this world would be a little strange. You know, so mm -hmm. we need the music, but we have to realize that it's, the, it's not just us by ourselves. We need them, and they need us. And as a team, we can work. You know, I mean, I, I love to play, so I'm going to play the way I play. But I think with an audience, you know, you can entertain them. You can have fun with them. You can get a response. You know, you can do you can a whole bunch of things you do that you can't do if you live stream. So the world has a perception of Kenny Garrett. Your family does, your friends, your fans. But you ultimately live your life. What's your perception of who you are? Who do you think you are? <laughs> I like that joke. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Who do I think I am? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, man. <laughs> well, I actually, I think I'm a motivator. That's in my mind. I think I'm a motivator. I'm really... I feel that I motivate people. At least that's what I hope. I hope that I'm motivating people to be the best who they can be. I mean, if it's, if it's about, I mean, it doesn't have to have anything to do with music. It's just I'm trying to motivate people to be the best who they can be. And I'm trying to be the best who I can be. That's who I, I think I am. <laughs> I'm just trying to be a motivator. Kenny, man, thank you for all the music. Thank you for taking some time out for Neon Jazz today. Best of luck as we move forward in this very strange time we're in. Uh, thank you, Joe, and I appreciate this question. <laughs> Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest cats in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Kenny for his time and class. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com, and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.